Thursday, every Thursday, except the third Thursday, which is Orange Audubon's normal uh, monthly program. So what we'll have tonight is announcements, then mystery birds, then some slides on bird migration with new departures and arrivals and some that are just passing through. And then the program of the night, which is bird photography by Jack Horton. And um, the next bird chat is September. Oh, did you 20. bring the snack bag inside? You got all your stuff I'm out of the car. Going. All your stuff out of the car. <laughs> okay, mute, mute. All right. Um, the next one is um, Swallowtail Kites and Shorttail Hawks by Gina Kent of the Avian Research and Conservation Institute in Gainesville. Um, she's worked for them about 18 years, and she's the one that climbs the trees and does the uh, fix, fixing the um, transmitters on the swallowtail kites. And I'm not sure if she they do that to shorttail hawks. We'll learn that then. But um, it, we've heard her talk at Orange Audubon, and it's wonderful. So we're excited to have her on September 24th. <clears throat> And I'd like to announce that it's in the mail. The brochure has, was put packaged together yesterday, thanks to all the helpers, including Susan. And um, if you are on our, are a member, you are getting one in the mail. And there are other places to pick it up, um, but we do encourage you to join our organization. And uh, you can find out how to do that at orangeaudubonfl.org. And this picture did not turn out good, <laughs> but um, Audubon's Florida's Conservation Leadership Initiative is um, have a deadline of September 12th, two days from now. So if you know anybody who's a college student who hasn't participated in this, Jeremy, um, my mentee from last year, co-mentor from last year is on the call. Um, he was in it and Brian Camerano was in it two years ago and some other uh, the Nighthawks Audubon at UCF, um, quite a few of them were in at CLI. Melissa Gonzalez was. So um, it's a very nice program that kind of brings college students into Audubon. And so if you know anybody to tell about it, to apply, the deadline is September 12th. And Kathy, you wanna just speak up about this? Sure, so um, we do a monthly survey at beautiful Wakaiwa Spring State Park. And if you think you've seen the park and you haven't hiked the trails and you haven't seen the gems of the park, it's amazing. Um, we do this as a service to the park uh, biologist. So if you're interested, there's my email. Um, it is this Saturday, we meet at seven. We're usually done around 1030, unless the birds are amazing, you never know. And you might get to see a Bob White like we did, that was from like two months ago when, when a whole family came out the road. So let me know if you have any questions. We do require social distancing and masks. Okay. And we're not gonna have a bird chat next Thursday because it's Orange Audubon's regular program, Cultivating the Wild, Bartram's Travels, a film, a one hour documentary um, which will be introduced by Robert Wilson. And for that one, you don't have to register and it's not on Zoom, it's on YouTube Live. So all you have to do is put Orange Audubon Society in the search field, go to Orange OAS YouTube Live channel at seven on the 17th. And we'll have plenty of reminders on Facebook. Okay, the Lake Apopka Wildlife Drive Ambassador Program could still use some help. Um, we are out there every Saturday and Sunday from 10 to 3, passing out um, maps and giving some tips on how to successfully and happily go through the wildlife drive. So just email volunteer at orangeaudubonfl.org if you are interested in volunteering. And now I will turn it over to... Me. Kathy. Yep. <laughs> okay, take it away. Okay. So every week we feature a mystery bird. And before I forget, if you would like to submit a photo for the mystery bird, it just needs to be a bird that's been seen recently. The photos don't have to be like 
National Geographic quality because it's real life, you know. Um, and sometimes those photos like that we get that are backlit and stuff, it helps us learn to be better birders. So if you want to submit one at the very end, you'll see an email that you can send them to and we'd be more than happy to feature your bird as the mystery bird. And if you really wanted to, you could talk about it, but you don't have to. So here is, um, and, and if you want to type in a name of the mystery bird, you can do so. And we're monitoring the chat and see if anyone knows. Now, this is a bird that's Actually, this has been a really good year to see these. Um, there's been some at the coast, of course, but the wildlife drive has been a pretty regular place to see these for the last few weeks. And um, I'm sure they're going to be leaving very soon. So does anyone want to put in the chat um, what this bird is? Are they both the same bird? Are they different birds? There's something different on the left or the right. You don't have to say it. You could just type it in. Um, and I'm looking, we're looking. So this is really, really cool bird. I'll give you some information while we're waiting to see if anyone submits an answer. So this is a bird, it's one of three of this type that are called, um, oh, I can't give that part of the email. <laughs> All right, but they do nest in large freshwater marshes. They're interesting because, oh, good guess. One Sorry. guess. Yes, immature laughing goal. That's a really good guess. And from far away, it would totally look like that. It would totally look like that. So that's a really reasonable guess. So in, in the breeding time, they're in freshwater marshes and they feed on small fish and a lot of insects. They can even capture insects from the air like a swallow or um, a nighthawk. They can even follow tractors and get the insects that are stirred up, but they also will feed over the marsh and they will feed over vegetation, which I've seen them doing at the wildlife drive. And they'll also feed over open water. In the winter time, they become a seabird. They live off the coast of Central and South America. So anyone else wanna, wanna take a guess on that bird? I know it's tough and, and they've tricked me a bunch of times, especially, you know, you don't always see them like face on or they're far away and their, their flight is different than most of the birds we see. Let's see if anyone's put an answer, not yet. Um, it is in the tern family, so that's a clue. And there are three terns known as marsh terns. Two of them are old world, world terns that don't come here at all. The white winged and the whisker terns because they all um, breed in the marsh. So I'm not seeing any answers. No one, no one wants to be brave and guess the mystery bird or say it out loud, anybody? <laughs> You got uh, a stumper. You got a stumper. Well, yeah. yeah, and it is the same bird. And Sam took these photos very recently. Um, I'll give you some more facts. If someone wants to guess, you can still guess. Um, this species is uh, of concern conservation wise. They've lost half their North American population in the last half century. That's pretty serious. And that's mostly due to um, decline of their prey species. So um, there's, suggestions in, in the breeding areas that more land is conserved in a mosaic wetlands with different types of plants um, to help them find their food. Um, and these birds are very social. It, it's been said that they can, I can you imagine this? Now we get just few migrants, but they can migrate in the tens of thousands. I just can't imagine. Well, okay, you can go ahead and let's show everybody what it is. You advance the slide. Okay, sir. Okay. It's the black tern. So sometimes you get lucky and one will fly right over you like the one on the right. And, and you can see he's in his uh, non-breeding plumage because it would be all dark if it was breeding plumage. So it, it kind of has that laughing gold look with the white face with some black, but the wings are really dark and the way they behave is very different than a gull. So, and then you can see three of them feeding there. So if you really want to see one, I would head out to the wildlife drive this, this weekend because they may be gone by the next weekend. All right, so next. All right, next we have departures. And leaving us is the great crested flycatcher. These are pretty, they describe them as big-headed, big-shouldered flycatchers. 
Um, what's distinctive is they have a yellow belly that kind of goes way up. It goes higher than most of the other flycatchers. They also have a nice um, reddish primaries and their tail. And of course, the crest at the top, which isn't always up. And you can see that they're cavity nesters. And one of the things I thought was very interesting looking at the research was someone did a study of nests and they found one um, one item in every nest that I thought was quite surprising. What do you think they found in every nest? Type in what you think. It's a natural item that they might have found in every single nest of these flycatchers. What do you think? Ooh, Bob S is pretty good here. Okay, it is snake skins. They found shedded snake skins in every single one of the nests that they studied. And I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, it's, they kind of like, I guess, that texture because they sometimes find the onion skins and of course cellophane, which we don't like too much, but it has that same texture. Um, there are, and if we can look at the next one, we'll see where they're heading. We'll go to the next slide. So there is a small population, as you can see, this stays year round at the southern end of Florida, but most of our birds in Florida, especially our area, are gonna go south. They're gonna be going down to Mexico, central, and kind of the northern part of South America, Cuba, that area. So that's our great crested flycatcher that is gonna be leaving us soon. And then coming, we're going to have a new bird passing through, and it's the eastern wood peewee. So these are um, peewees are going to be, they're kind of a smaller than a Phoebe, but a little bit bigger than some of the smaller flycatchers. They're kind of more of a grayish. They have a very weak to no eye ring. It's almost hard to see it. Um, and they appear to be wearing a gray vest. As you can see on the left, you can see the little white comes up and it looks like a little vest. They have, if you're finding them, you listen for their little peewee. They pretty much say their name and the males sing both in breeding and non-breeding. So we're seeing them on migration. So they will be singing. They kind of sally, they call it sallying, sally out from the mid canopy to catch insects. And I think one study said that they do it 36 times per hour but then they will go and sit on some nice, they do like dead snags, and you can get a nice picture when they're sitting there, since we're talking about pictures in a little bit. They do forage higher, a little bit higher in trees than the least in Acadians, but a little bit lower than the great crested. The oldest bird they have on record was eight years and two months, but which the bird bounders, banders found. And then we can look at where they're heading for on our next slide. May I we first play the peewee sound, moving. Susan? Yep. Our next slide. That's the sound. Oh, that's, yep. Peewee. Peewee. <laughs> but only in breeding. Uh, do, you, do you ever hear them down here? Do you know? I don't know, but they said, the research said that they'd sing in both, so. Mm -hmm. Um, they are moving through our area and you can see they will be heading towards the northern end of South America, the northern part of South America. Very good. That's me. Sorry. That's one of my um, favorites. Yeah. So for new arrivals, uh, which we just saw this last weekend, uh, is the Wilson Snipe. Uh, Really cool little bird. Um, it's a medium-sized sandpiper. It's long and straight bill, around six centimeters long. The females have longer bills. Um, and if you can see in this picture, the crown, it's striped with alternating black and buffy. Um, and it looks, if you look at it straight on, it's got a, uh, it's just pretty much striped right down the front of the, the face and the head. So um, the underparts are a mix of brown and black with gray, and it forms spots and uh, barring underneath. So, which uh, the most similar bird we have to it that we see down here is the American woodcock, and it um, it actually has a little. T it's more of a white, pale belly, and has a little bit of orange. And actually, I got one last year during the uh, birding festival, um, and I was with Mary Soul, and we couldn't figure out if it was. 
uh, a snipe or not. And I said, well, it had orange underneath and we looked it up and sure enough, it was the woodcock. So anyway, um, the other bird is similar to, which we also saw last weekend is a dowager, especially if you're looking at a book or a guide or not that familiar with these birds, but the dowagers are larger and they have longer legs. Um, they, uh, and both the dowagers and the woodcock uh, have a more direct flight pattern. When you, usually the way you see a snipe is on accident or you scare it up and it'll scare you as well as it scares it. And it has a very erratic zigzag pattern and will call away from you. So um, it, they winter here, we'll start seeing them now and we get them as late as April, but they're most prolific here between in December and January. They just really fill up down here, just like other snowbirds, I guess. So um, they're usually found in like wet and marshy areas. And for example, most of the time, you know, a lot of us spend a lot of time at Lake Apopka Wildlife Drive. Where I was seeing them for the last few years is actually in the grass between the water and the road, closer to the water but just hunkered down in there. So, and they're usually, like I said, they'll sit until you're almost on top of them. So you can take pictures right out of your car, which uh, now Jack will explain. I think that's part of his presentation. Okay, thanks guys. And turn it over to Jack. Should I stop the share, Jack? And Hey guys, okay. hi everybody, I'm Jack Horton. Um, I gotta share my screen here. How's that, you guys see it? Yep. All right, um, I'm Jack Horton. I've been an amateur photographer for um, the better part of my life. And there we go. Um, and what I'd like to share with you this evening is what I've learned about using my vehicle as a photo blind. Um, why does this work? Um, my guess is they, guess they see something moving on legs and they react to it. And a vehicle's not like that. Uh, locations that I use locally, uh, Joe Overstreet and Three Lakes Wildlife Management Area, um, those are about an hour, hour and a half away. Uh, Lake Apopka Wildlife Drive, which is about 15 minutes away from me and Black Point and uh, Merritt Island surrounding areas, which are about an hour from me. Uh, your vehicle would be a good starting point uh, to go and get some shots. Uh, before you depart, um, check your stuff, have backups. Um, I have gotten up at 4.30 in the morning and driven down to Three Lakes and gotten set up and then discovered I had no batteries, no backups, none. And um, so it was a scouting trip. Um, is it cold? You might want to take blankets, keep yourself warm in a car if the engine's not running. Uh, I tend to bring extra keys because I just tend to be a little paranoid about uh, locking my keys in. Um, homework the night before, uh, check the weather and check eBird. Uh, if you haven't been on eBird, I would suggest to go to our Orange Audubon Society YouTube channel. We have a bird chat that has a eBird episode and it's really good. It's a really gr great way to find out what people are seeing and where. Uh, in the morning, I pack up my, my gear. I check traffic. Uh, locally, Interstate 4 has been a mess for quite some time. It's, I call it a pinball machine because it's, it's ever changing. And then I turn my dome light off because I might have my door open for quite some time and I don't want that drain on the battery. This is a, a picture of my back seat and I've got a lens strapped in there using a, a seatbelt. If I had camera bags in the front passenger seat, I would use the seatbelt to strap them in as well. Um, I want to talk about stable platform, which is basically your door. Uh, in my experience, any lens 300 millimeter or higher you need to start thinking about stabilization. Uh, with stabilization, you get more sharp images and fewer soft images. Uh, you're able to go with a lower shutter speed when needed, uh, which in turn gets your ISO lower, which in turn make your images much better quality. Uh, 
probably one of the biggest things with a platform is there's no fatigue. I can stay locked on to a, an animal for, for, for an indefinite amount of time because there's no, no fatigue uh, involved with it. I do turn my engine off. I don't want any movement inside the vehicle at all when I'm set up. Um, so I shoot out the window and in the past, I've used a towel. Um, I've used plumber's, plumber's pipe insulation, which already has a lengthwise cut. Um, I've seen people use a pool noodle, which they have to cut. And currently I use a bean bag and a particular one I use is, a, is called a savvy sack. And I, I'm very, very happy with, with this, uh, this piece of equipment. Um, I just talked about a soft image and, and sharp image. And this is an example of a soft image. Um, why is it soft? It could be the focus, could be vibration of your environment, uh, like you holding it. It could be the shutter speed's too slow. There's any number of reasons it could be, be that way. And if you look at the bubble right here on the leg, uh, this is probably within a tenth of a second or less later. And that bubble's still there, and that's a sharp image. So with a stable platform, I'm going to get more sharp images and also very sharp images, which to me is, is a big deal. Um, here, here I am using a towel. I've got my hand cup because I was shooting into, a, shooting into the sun, so I cut my hand up there to block the sun. Uh, here I am using a, a, a beanbag, uh, the one I use, Savvy Sack. It fits over there. It cradles the, uh, the camera nicely. I have bird seed in mine. I don't ever purposely empty it out there. <laughs> also, at times, I'll have the subject, which is high up in a tree, but right next to me, and I'll roll my window up, and I'll lower my seat all the way down so I can shoot up at an extreme angle. By doing that, I got this shot of this Cooper's Hawk, and I'm way down in my seat, and I got the window up as far as it'll go, and I'm taking pictures of this guy and it's, there's no fatigue. I can mess with my settings. It's almost like you're at a model photo shoot and it's like, um, you know, with the model, would you please look the other way, please? Very nice, thank you. Okay, hold that for a moment, okay. Uh, will you please look towards the camera and slightly move your head, your forehead down? Thank you, beautiful, 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 hold that. Okay, now if you could tilt your head up a little bit and maybe like look over the camera lens. Awesome, thank you, very nice. And, and, and last shot, can you look directly up? Can you just turn your head and look directly up? I, I know it's asking a lot, but you know, would you please do that for this last shot? Awesome, thank you so much. And my point being is I've got a 600, mil, 600 millimeter lens and I can hand hold it but I can't do that for a long time. And I definitely can't do that and get nearly as many sharp set sharp shots as if I'm using some kind of support to do that. Um, if you've got a zoom lens, zoom lens that zooms out to 500, I don't care how lightweight it is, you're gonna run into fatigue, you're gonna run into shaking. Um, and, and I just think a stable platform is a, is a, is a big, big deal for sharp, for sharp photos. Sometimes there are things in front of the road in front of you. And so I'll stop and I'll take the keys out of the ignition. I'll slowly open the door. I'll slowly get out, get set up because you don't, you don't want to disturb anybody. You don't want to wake them up. And the reality is eventually you have to drive down where they are because there's no other place to go. But I got this shot doing that. And this also points out the advantage of using long glass it looks like I'm down on the ground. I guarantee you I'm not down on the ground. I'm shooting out of my truck window here. Um, we, we won't get into my, my artificial left hip and my uh, someday soon to be artificial right knee. Um, sometimes I'll come out and shoot this way and I'm still using my vehicle as a blind. Same thing off the back of the truck. I'm still using my vehicle as a blind and I move very slowly when I do this. Uh, etiquette. Uh, be considerate of those already in position. Don't shut your door. 
it's the noise. Don't make noise. Don't talk. Make sure your phone's on silent. Don't even have it on vibrate. Get your key out of the ignition. Those people in position, whether they are looking through a camera or looking through binoculars or looking through a spotting scope, they may have worked hard and long to just happen to be at the right place at the right time. And now you're coming in after that. So try to learn from that. Don't disturb them. There'll be other days. You can, over time, you can get your shots. Um, some things I've learned with, like with kingfishers, I tend to get my lens out early and approach them slowly. I found that if I approach them slowly and stop and then put the lens out, they leave. They usually leave anyway, but I've had a little bit better luck with that approach. Backing up on something, basically driving by it and then backing up slowly like I'm sneaking up on them. Ha <laughs> ha. Uh, I have not had good results with that. The other thing you do with the stable platform is you can practice your settings. I know pretty much with my back, the back dial with my thumb, I can roll, I can roll twice. Whoa. Are you me? I, I guess so. <laughs> I don't, don't know how I did that. Can somebody mute them? Thank you. Um, I can roll my back thumb twice and I can go from one six, 640th to one 3,200th of a second. So I can basically go from a, a portrait number, which for me, this is a stationary portrait number, shutter speed, to a very fast bird in flight speed. Whoa, I didn't want to do that. <laughs> Hang on, I got to go backwards. There we go. Stay away from that side of the monitor. Um, you can also practice your f-stop. You can also practice if you've been shooting in some kind of automated mode, one thing you can do is learn how to move your focus points. And if you're on a stable platform, you can practice moving your focus points and work on getting them on the eyeball. Cause that's, a, if anything's in focus, you want the eye in focus. I tend to leave my camera in bird in flight mode, which means a, a fast shutter speed. Don't hesitate to reposition yourself inside your vehicle. I may pull my mirrors in. Um, also look for holes in the vegetation, if you have a bunch of cattails and there's a hole, I'm going to position myself in the hole. And also watch out on windy days, those cattails are going to be moving. So that window is going to be a moving window. So if you're not sure, look up over your lens and you'll see if there's any vegetation coming back and forth in front of your lens. That'll give you a soft, that'll give you a soft photo. Patience is crucial in photography. It's just wait and wait some more. Um, you want to try to have the sun and the wind at your back. Uh, sometimes the subjects will cooperate. Most times they will not. Um, to me, the background is just as important as the subject itself. Uh, but I, more on that in just a moment. Long glass has many exact advantages. Um, I can stay further back. I can have the illusion that I've gotten low to the ground when I actually haven't. Uh, weight is not one of the advantages of, of longer glass. Typically, it's, it's pretty heavy. All right, this is a locally known great blue heron called Crookneck that you can find around McDonald's Canal and um, Welland at the Lake Apopka Wildlife Drive. I have no idea why his neck's like that, but it's like that. But what I'd like you to try for a moment is to, to look at this photo and to lean back and then don't focus on the photo, just try to look through it and see what gets your attention. And for me, what gets my attention are these two pieces of light up here. This one down here really gets my attention. This gets my attention that the back of the neck is lit up, but yet the face is not lit up. So to me, this is a pretty busy background. And it, to me, it's, it's distracting. It's taking away from the subject. It is backlit. You can have great backlit photographs, but this one has got a lot of stuff. Um, so in contrast with this one, the background doesn't draw your eye. 
you're drawn to the interaction of the two great blue herons. The shadows that are there are pretty light. There's some right in here. The sun is very low. The sun is maybe 30 minutes or less above the horizon. There's no clouds. So we have this kind of this goldish look. Uh, some people call it the golden hour. Um, and it, it, that to me is the difference between that background and that background. All right. Um, there are many ways to do things. All I'm doing is sharing how I do things and what I have developed and changed over time. I think it's crucial that you learn the subjects and you learn as much as you can about them because that's going to make it easier to predict how they're going to behave and where they're going to be. Um, what are birds to me? Birds to me, they're, they're fascinating. Uh, they're beautiful. They are amazing little monsters. They wake up every day and it's a fight for survival and it's eat or be eaten. Um, I really think it's important that you love your subject in photography. And if you love your subject, you'll be much more forgiving with it and you'll be much more patient with it. And I think that's just a, a, a big thing that will help you to sit out in the middle of nowhere and fighting off bugs or fighting off the elements and, and, and waiting or hoping that this particular subject, this bird turns your way. I actually at times will just sit there and, and talk with them in a low voice and like, okay, just, just turn towards the sun and hold it for a couple seconds. Just, just turn. Um, but anyway, um, I, I'd like to close with, uh, you've got many choices of what to, do, what to do with your time. And I'd like to thank you for spending some of your time with me. Um, I, I certainly do appreciate it. Um, at this time, are there, I don't know if Susan can moderate. Are there any questions? And I need to go here. Go to the next slide, Jack. This is the question slide. Uh, uh, I got to go here. There, there we go. Questions. Yeah. And I can't see chat right now. All right. So Jeremy is asking, what camera and lenses would you recommend? Um, one of my brothers, who's actually, I think, on this Zoom, told me a long, long time ago that uh, good glass will outlive you. So I would suggest if you're gonna spend money, spend it on good glass, um, that that is gonna be good. Camera bodies come and go. Um, I use Nikon equipment, but any equipment's fine. Uh, but I would go for good glass. I would buy used glass. I have a used, like three times over, I think I'm the third or fourth owner of a 300 millimeter 2.8 Nikon that I got a real good deal. And it's one of the sharpest pieces of glass I have. It's really, really sharp. Um, How do you buy used? Um, there's a couple of websites. There's one called, I think it's KEH. Um, there are um, uh, also, there's websites dedicated to particular brands. I know the Nikon brands, like the Nikon Cafe is a good place to look for used equipment. The people in there are just incredible and they will share with you anything they know. I'm sure there's a website like that, a message board like that for Canon people and for Sony people and on and on. Um, also, there's a Fred Meridian website and they're, they're really known that if you want to sell your Nikon gear or any gear, that's a really good place. They do a really good job of uh, uh, policing and, and keeping track of, of, of who's honest. Hey, Jack, how far were you from that Cooper's Hawk when you did that picture? I, I would guess between 60 and 100 feet. I, I've got a camera, I got camera bodies I can, I can sometimes crop substantially uh, and still have a lot, of, uh, a lot of data in the file. Yeah, he, he, was, he's, he, he was on a known uh, snag perch and out in the open and I was driving by and I pulled over and stopped and 
turned off and set up and then raised the window and it it stayed there. I was waiting for it to fly off. It never flew off while I was there. I eventually left. What do you think is the hardest bird to photograph uh, the, that you've had to photograph? First thing that popped in my head was the, the one that just left. Getting woodpeckers in flight is pretty tough. Um, I found I have to go to one five thousandths of a second. And also they tend to, when they take off, they tend to drop, dive straight down and then they tend to undulate. They, they, they flap their wings and come up and then glide and flap their wings, come up and glide. And they, they are tough. Um, uh, those, those in flight are tough. Um, yeah, I, and, and some of the little ones are tough when they're buried in brush and trying to get a shot of their eye, not a shot of their butt. Um, it is, it is tough. Very good. Sam, you're a good photographer too. Do you want to add anything or question Jack about anything? No, I was, I was actually going to ask, uh, do you shoot with a tripod at all? Like if you're out in the field, like when you go for the red cockades and stuff? Yeah, I do. Um, yeah, it's behind me in the back seat. I've got a gimbal head on it. A gimbal head is a head that you can you can balance your your camera lens on. That literally, if the wind's blowing, it's like a wind vane. It'll blow around, and you can set it on whatever you wherever you want, and it stays there. So for birds in flight, it's really good. But yeah, I will uh, bring the legs in and take it out. Yeah, I put it on my shoulder and I go, and just to have the stable platform. And it's. I guess in my mind, it's like, okay, it's like a, it's like a monopod, but it's got two extra legs I have to adjust. Uh, right. I have a gimbal on a monopod that I use a lot just because it's easier to carry. But uh, I think it's important to let everybody know too that, you know, you're not going to be a super pro photographer right out of the gate and making do with what you, what you have. And the beauty of shooting now versus somebody who like Steve Shaluda is a great photographer. Well, he shot film for 40 years, which I couldn't even imagine. Like he processed his own pictures, but I mean, I use my camera, I would say at least 90% for ID shots more than I do for, hey, I need to get a really cool shot of this. Like I've, I think uh, I was with Mark Mark this morning and he said, you're way more of a birder than you are a photographer now. And I don't know if that was a, compliment or an insult but i'll use it to especially like jack said with the small birds and right now we're getting into fall migration but you know they're fast and if you know you've got a red start and a prairie and a yellow and everything's flying around and if if i can take a shot and look at the back of my camera and go oh okay i don't need to chase that i've got a million pictures of yellows or there's a million yellows out here i think it's it's important for anybody not to be you know self-conscious about your photos or I mean I ask every day I posted pictures yesterday on what's this bird and whether it's birding or photography I'll, I'll be the first I mean half the time I see Jack and I ask him uh, camera questions and when I see Kathy I'm like you're really good with you know bird calls what is this you know and, and you can't be embarrassed to ask or you know I would say the majority of people out there are super nice and they're going to try to help you you know, it's, uh, it's a good community. So don't, don't be afraid to jump into it and go, you know, I don't know what this is. I mean, it could be a morning dove and yeah, in my head, I might be going, man, that's a morning dove. But if it's your first time out or you don't know what it is, then there's no reason for me to ridicule you. It's like, cause we do it. I do it every day. You know, I did it today with a mockingbird that I was looking for another bird and I was so excited and I snapped a quick picture and then I looked at it and I go, Oh, it's a mockingbird, the state bird of Florida, not that rare around here. So anyway, I just think it's important to ask questions and to ask for help and especially on IDs and cameras and, you know, settings even. And Google is your friend. You can type in any question on the planet and you're going to get an answer. It may not be the best answer, but, you know, rainy days, I try to sit in front of my computer and actually learn how to work my camera. So. Yeah, one of, the, one of the best approach lines that I've heard, I forgot who told me to use it, and that is to ask, have you seen, seen anything good? <laughs> and, and if they're willing to share, you're going to find out right then. 
and they'll start sharing and it's it's pretty cool anybody else while well, we have jack here fo focused on him well lori did say in the chat that we are all continually learning so i think that's the important thing keep working on those that photography practicing and our birds Hundred percent. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Jack. And we'll see you all next week for the Bartram program and then the following week for um, Gina Kent and Swallowtail Kites. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Nice work, Jack. Yeah. Great job, Jack. Thanks, guys.